Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the forum. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral. It is such a pleasure to see you here this morning. It's the, it's the, first, um, the first forum of our fall season, and we're so excited about um, what we have to offer today. On Wednesday, we marked the 18th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. In some ways, this terrible event marked a turning point in our country, and we can see its effects today in how the United States interacts with the rest of the world. It was the single loss, largest loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act. Before 9-11, it was Jonestown. On November 18, 1978, in Guyana, at the People's Temple Agricultural Project, more than 900 followers of the cult leader Jim Jones were killed in a mass murder-suicide. A congressman from California, Leo Ryan, was in Jonestown with a small team investigating the cult's activities, and he was shot and killed by Jones's followers. For a young aide to Ryan, this terrible event and her survival marked a turning point in her life, a story which she tells in her book, Undaunted, Surviving Jonestown, Summoning Courage, and Fighting Back. Our guest today is the U.S. representative for California's 14th congrega con congregational district. Yeah. You know, that would work. <laughs> Things would be much better if that's the way we look at it. I know, it really would be. <laughs> Oh my goodness. It includes much of San Mateo County and a portion of Southern San Francisco. She is a champion of women's rights, personal privacy, and consumer safety, as well as an avowed opponent of government inefficiency and waste. In 2012, she was named to Newsweek's list of 150 fearless women in the world and is included in the 2018 Politico 50 list of top influencers transforming American politics. Please join me in welcoming Jackie Speer. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, just in the, when we were taking photographs before we came in, I, I said, uh, uh, Jackie, I mean, uh, the, um, I, I, I'm so near tragedy because when something bad happens, I, I'm the person who gets called. Um, but uh, most people just don't face the, the numbers and level of, of the kind of tragic events that you've had in your life. And, and it's remarkable to me that you still have a kind of lightness of being because I think a lot of other people, you know, sometimes can take a different turn after, after being through events like that. But I wonder if, um, if you can talk a little bit about just kind of where you came from. I, I mean, I, I just, every time I'm in um, outer sunset for the last two weeks, I've been thinking about you. But uh -huh. um, maybe you can talk a little bit about just, you know, growing up and, and who some of your heroes were, because they were really preparing you for something that you, none, of, none of you could have imagined. So thank you, Malcolm. I had a very common blue-collar upbringing. Yeah. My parents were... Um, both victims of atrocities, really. My mother, Armenian-American, who lost a good number of her family members in the genocide um, at the end of World War I. Uh, my father uh, was the son of a Catholic mother and an Ashkenazi Jew. So my grandfather was taken by the Gestapo in eight, late 39, I think. Uh, can't be absolutely certain of the date. And my grandmother, who was this powerful matriarch of our family, went to the local uh, commandant and said, um, you can't take Theodore. He, was, he served in World War I. He was wounded and meddled. I don't know what she did, if money exchanged hands, but she got him out. And they left immediately by ship to Shanghai and spent the war years in Shanghai. So from those... Very humble beginnings. I was raised uh, by parents who had never gone to college and uh, who, had, who struggled a good part of their yeah. lives. And so we had a fairly austere upbringing. Um, I, I mentioned in the book that you didn't make a list of Christmas presents you want. You got whatever you got. And I got a dented suitcase one Christmas. Right, right, I remember that. <laughs> Um, we, we were, and you didn't know that things were so austere, really. Um, my father worked for Loomis Armored Car and became a shop steward. And the one time I remember being scared was when my mom told me that um, my dad was going on strike. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I remember peering um, around the corner of the garage when he drove in trying to decide 
what that that mean? Um, right, exactly. You know, How terrifying when you're so dependent on that one income to, you know, to 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 have that be at risk. And even as a child, you may not understand all the ramifications, but you certainly understand that this is a you know life and death matter. You mentioned that you wanted to read a little bit of the preface sure. for us. And so I'll just read the prologue because it kind of sets the stage. Yeah, yeah. Wearing glasses now, it's very. I was admiring disturbing. your glasses. Disturbing. <laughs> it's better than the alternative, which is not being able to right, see. Right. You know, thank you for reminding yeah. me. <laughs> I was dying. It was just a matter of time. Lying behind a wheel of the airplane, bleeding out of the right side of my devastated body, I waited for the rapid shooting to stop, then said the act of contrition, praying by rote for forgiveness. I used what little energy I had left to finish that prayer before the lights went out. But the lights didn't go out, and I slowly began to take stock of my situation. I was 28 years old, and I was about to die. My life would never be the one I had imagined. I'd never get married, or become a mother of a boy and girl, or leave the world a better place, or gently pass when it was my time to go, surrounded by loved ones. Instead, my story was coming to an end on the dusty runway in the humid Guyanese jungle, thousands of miles from home. I don't know if it's possible to articulate how urgently aware you become of the fleeting nature of your existence when you're confronted with its end. I lay there for what felt like an eternity. Somehow, through the encroaching darkness of my final thoughts, I saw my 87-year-old grandma, Emma, the tough, marvelous matriarch of my family. All I could think of was, I'm not going to make my grandma live through my funeral, not if I can help it. I couldn't bear the vision of her sitting in front of my casket, suffering. If not for my reverence for her, I don't believe I would be alive today. She encouraged me to summon my will to move. Breathing heavily, I dragged my shattered body away from the wheel. Neither my doctors nor I could explain how I physically managed it, given my state, but I pulled myself up to my feet and stumbled around to the shelter of the baggage compartment. I survived. Survival against unfathomable odds can make every day that follows swell with a renewed sense of purpose, though not immediately and not for everyone. But with the hindsight of 40 years, I see that my baptism by gunfire guided me into the life I was meant to live, one of public service, one that would ignite the courage to make my voice heard, and one that would carry with it a visceral appreciation for each new day. That sentiment was far from my desperate thoughts at the time. Truth be told, it would have been far easier to have closed the box on Guyana long ago, or to have pushed that memory away into the recesses of my mind. What happened in that jungle was a massacre, a nightmare. Though I survived, something within me did die on that airstrip, be it my innocence or my belief in the natural fairness of life. But I can't deny how radically that nightmare molded my perspective and my instincts and how much it has informed the woman I am today. We don't get to choose our formative moments. Very often, adversity and failure shape us more permanently than fortune and success. That has certainly been the case in my life. The major setbacks, and there have been many, have actually propelled me onward, each one reminding me how important it is to stand up again, as difficult as it may be, stronger and more steadfast. Pain yields action. It can introduce a fervor to speak out for those whose voices are not heard. Surviving Jonestown crystallized where I needed to focus my energy. It convinced me that I had a purpose. All I had to do was figure out how to fulfill it. Thank you very much. You know, I, I think so much of that. I mean, because in a way, there's two elements to it. Uh, you, one element is just the extraordinary effect it had on your life and then what th that meant for the rest of us. But there also is this element, too, of just like what Jonestown meant for kind of our collective consciousness. And I, I, I think you're probably going to be the person who I know 
who, who, who knows the most about it. Just because you know, you're so close to the, what actually happened, you were, you'd done the research before you, you, you went there, so you'd heard testimonies from people who had escaped from Jonestown, people who wanted to get their families out. And then you've also just kind of seen, you've been at the center of how that's unfolded for the rest of us too. So I wonder if you can talk about its effect on our life as a society. Well, I worry sometimes that it didn't have a profound enough effect on yeah. our lives. Before we made the trip, I was, um, I was very anxious about the trip. I was about to purchase a condo in Virginia, and I had a clause put in the contract that said this would be null and void if I didn't survive going to Jonestown. Um, I wrote a note to my parents um, that's actually um, yeah, in the book. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, and so there was all of that going into it. Uh, I'm often asked, well, why did you go? Um, and in part, I was a young, um, a professional woman in Congress. There were a few of us there yeah. at that time. And I thought if I didn't go, um, that somehow that would set us back. And I can completely see how that would be, be a huge motivator. I mean, so you do, you feel like you have to have a higher standard than you would right. be if you're just, you know, one of the guys, you know? So what happened here in San Francisco is more than shameful. It was... Um, malfeasance on the, at the highest level because Jim Jones had so ingratiated himself into the powerful political uh, superstructure in San Francisco. He helped to get George Moscone elected and then he helped uh, repelling the uh, recall and so he got his what he deserved, he thought, because um, he wanted the uh, housing authority chairmanship and he was offered the Human Relations Commission, and he said, no, that's not good enough, and so eventually he did get the Housing Authority post. But there were already rumors about physical abuse and sexual abuse and child abuse and gun running, and everyone in the city looked the other way. Yeah. And Congressman Ryan got involved because constituents of his parents of young adults who had gotten involved in the People's Temple here in San Francisco were concerned. So when he took some 900 of his members to Jonestown uh, because he was fearing the backlash that was going to come out once the New West story was written and published, uh, these, these family members were concerned. And so that's why Leo Ryan got involved. Marshall Kilduff, uh, who is still mm -hmm. uh, on the editorial board of the San Francisco Chronicle. You should jot him a note to just say thank you because he started following Jim Jones at the housing authority meetings and he knew there was something odd because he would bring with him you know, 10 or 15 members of the congregation. Every time that uh, Jim Jones spoke, he, they would applaud, they would get up. Right, there was right. kind of a Strange, unusual yeah. um, experience going on. And so he started you know, sniffing around, as a journalist does, and found that there were you know, many, uh, many problems. And the Chronicle would not publish the article mm -hmm. because um, they had gotten letters right. threatening lawsuits, and they had gotten lots of letters from members of the, of the congregation saying how wonderful he was. Yeah, it's like intimidation tactics yeah, at every level. They're very Always. good at yeah, intimidation. Yeah. So, that, so when the story got printed in New West, uh, on the eve of that, Jones left. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, they were there for about a year before and we actually... And to have 900 went. people killed. I, you know, I mean, I, I think of all the ramifications of September 11th and how many people died as a result of what happened on that day. And it, it is. I, 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 it's almost like the whole story was too embarrassing for us. And we kind of... I didn't, you know, it didn't have the same effect as, as that, those terrible events. No, I think that's true. I think everyone who had fingerprints on creating this travesty yeah. um, by allowing him to get as big as he did without getting constrained, um, you know, wanted to just bury it. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm a, a deeply faithful Catholic, and I'm a lector at my, my parish. But I, I look at the Catholic Church, and you see similar threads of mm. just the willingness for law enforcement to look the other way, or the hierarchy within an institution to somehow think that um, they can take care of it right. by just moving you know, 
priests around, as happened in the Catholic yeah. Church. You know, so accountability in, in the case of the Catholic Church is coming you know, decades later. Yeah. Or there, now you have attorney generals in states that are actually charging them. But, you know, that didn't happen 30, 40 years yeah, ago. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a huge cultural change. And, and I just, I, we, it was the 50th anniversary of Bishop Pike's death a prominent uh, uh, Protestant figure of the 1960s. And, um, and the same thing, the newspapers, they knew so much and they just withheld mm -hmm. um, sharing it because they, of a sense of propriety or decorum or what have you. And, um, and, and that part of the result was things could get worse and worse as um, those things were hidden. Um, you, you describe your recovery. This year, every year our cathedral has a theme. And our theme this year is the body Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just like uh, how, what the recovery taught you about your body. And then um, I, I also wanted to ask you just about you know, how that in, has informed the work that you've done since then in terms of your legislative agenda. So I was you know, blown up on the right side of my body. Um, the whole, uh, there was this huge hole in my right thigh. Um, and I did Dr. Oz when the book first came out, and he, of course, had to make it medical, so he puts an <laughs> anatomical <laughs> um, picture of a human body to show everyone where the femoral artery um, yeah. runs. And the truth of the matter is, the, all the tissue around my right thigh was, was blown up, but the femoral artery was not severed. And yet, had it been severed, I would have died in 90 seconds. Yeah. So, I, um, on that airstrip for 22 hours without medical attention, obviously lost a lot of blood. Uh, finally get airlifted out of uh, the capital of Guyana uh, and on a U.S. medevac plane. So I'm taken from this cargo plane where they had brought us to the um, airport in Georgetown, Guyana, and there's this shiny white plane yeah. with the words United States of America on it. And I never sing the national anthem or uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance without going back to that moment because we are so lucky to live here. Yeah, we really are. Um, and we, we take so much for granted. Yeah. So when I got airlifted out of there, they, I had gas gangrene. They were going to amputate my arm and or my leg. I was um, taking hyperbaric ch uh, chamber treatments right. at the Baltimore Shock Trauma Center. I'm coming out of one of these dives, as they refer to it. And the doctor comes up to me and says, I hate to tell you this, but George Moscone has just been assassinated. Right, right. I'm living, you know, here I'm living in what looks like this iron lung, thinking yeah. the whole world's coming to an end. I, I mean, know, that's, exactly. that's sort of where I was. Yeah. Um, so the recovery, two months of hospitalization, many years of rehab and physical therapy. And then the toughest part of it all was coming to grips with my deformed body. Right, right. Right. And I would never go out to a swimming pool or the beach without being clothed. Um, I'd have a swimsuit on, but I'd be clothed. Right. And then, oh, maybe four years after, I was in Hawaii, and I had a sarong on, and uh, I thought, you know, this is who I am. This is not going to be different. I've got to embrace the scars on my body. And, and, you know, recognize that it's who, this is who I am. So I took the sarong off and walked the beach. And some people looked aghast. But some people, frankly, didn't even look at all. <laughs> and, um, and it was so empowering. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, and it, when we kind of take hold of um, ourselves, our warts and all, and move forward. It's a very empowering experience. Yeah, in a way, it's funny, because I think, I mean, you're so much in the public eye. I mean, just everything you do becomes magnified in the press. In a way, that, um, that ability to just not, to, to be able to let that go, maybe uh, something that helps you in, in, your, in your work as, a, as a, a civil servant. Can you talk a little bit about just how you made that transition? Like, I, I mean, when you were a child, um, were you thinking that you could possibly be a member of Congress one day? I mean, uh, it would have seemed hard to imagine, right. you know? So how did you get from that point to, to kind of where you are today? So I'd love telling the story to young people because uh, yeah. they, you know, they all have dreams and aspirations. We all do. But they don't think they have what it takes. Yeah. I did not think I had what it took. 
I got involved in politics when I was 16. I worked on my first political campaign, but I never thought I had what it took. Now, you're from Davis. Yeah. Um, I ended going um, to UC Davis because I got rejected from the only other school that I had applied to, and that was Stanford. And you made the right choice. <laughs> Davis is such a great place. And you know, if you hadn't have been at Davis, you wouldn't have been exactly. at Sacramento. Exactly. And I mean, so that's what I tell yeah. people all the time: is that you know, there's a plan for each of us. Sometimes yeah. we're not privy to it, or we have an aha moment. You know, 10, 12 years later, maybe hunting, maybe 25 years later. But for me, that's exactly where yeah. I was supposed to go because then it put me. Uh, 20 minutes from the state capitol, and I started as an intern for Assemblyman Ryan. Yeah, because he came to campus and right. you went out. To, he, he looked you up, and the two of you went out to dinner, and and that was kind of launched things. But it, even that, I mean, he came to talk to a, a class, um, and it was a small class of maybe you know 25 students. There's a woman sitting next to me. Asks her, "Do you know Jackie Spear?" Well, there's 12,000 kids at. UC Davis. Yeah. I'm in a dorm of 30 girls. She's one of the girls in the dorm. Uh, so I mean, <laughs> all these, you know, coincidences, I, although they're not, I think yeah. there's, there is this plan. Uh, and I love that part of it too, because there's a way that you can, when you speak out of a situation of terrible tragedy, it has a different kind of meaning than, than, mm -hmm. than it's, it's not a philosophical statement. It's like an observation about how you feel and what your experience has been. What did you learn from Leo Ryan? I, just um, reading the, the book, I, I, just, I, I just felt a sense of your admiration for him. I mean, uh, and I can imagine that you know, 20 something old Jackie kind of looking up to this person and, and, and taking note of what he does that you, you'd want to emulate yourself. So he truly was a mentor to me. Um, when I was in college, I took a, a, a independent study and got two units for um, working in his office. And so I wrote this really critical paper about him because I thought I'd get a better grade if I was very analytical. Well, that's never, what you do in college. <laughs> never thinking for a moment that he would ever read it. <clears throat> so I brought it in for the two secretaries in the office who were, had become friends, and they're reading it. He walks in to the office, sees one of them reading something, says, oh, is that Jackie's paper? He takes it. He rips it apart. I had gotten an A- minus on that. He crossed out the A- minus and put a C- minus on it. <laughs> <clears throat> and he said, you know, you don't know how to write, and I'm going to teach you. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so he was an incredible mentor to me. Um, you know, in many respects, I uh, feel like I had so much more to learn from him yeah. that got it got short. Right, exactly. Changed more years of, would have helped. Yeah. Um, so, but I did learn about being an experiential legislator. Yeah, yeah. You know, he went to Folsom Prison and spent a week in um, solitary to see about criminal um, justice reform. And, um, yeah, so he was imprisoned there right. to see what it would be like, yeah. And uh, there was a time when I was in the state legislature that I spent a night at a woman's state prison. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> they were complaining about not having pillows, so I was kind of trying to get pillows for these. I, then I'm, I'm sleeping on one of these pillows. It was hard as a rock. I don't know why they wanted it anyway. <laughs> but, um, and then it's, um, well, the experiential nature um, was also, um, I was impressed by um, Pope Francis, who had yeah. uh, walked among the, the homeless. So I spent the night not so long ago at a homeless shelter. Right, right. Um, and it, so it, it has done a, he was very, um, compelling in terms of teaching me how important it was to walk in someone else's shoes. Right, right. Yeah, and, and going to Guyana was just is part of, right. you know, wanting to really be there. Yeah, that's interesting. And then it, you, you ran for his seat, and then, you know, what happened there? What did you learn? And, and I, I, sometimes I think people are scared to take things on, big things like that on, but you, you sometimes learn enough to make it worth it, you know? Well, this is another thing I, I tell young people. I'm a three-time loser. This is what a three-time loser looks like, because <laughs> <laughs> I lost for president yeah. in high school, student body president. Student body, yeah. I lost the first time I ran for Congress, and yeah. then I lost when I ran for lieutenant governor. For California. So uh, 
that was another planned experience when you think about it. I was hospitalized for two months. They had, I had death threats, so I had 24-hour U.S. Right, so martial protection. Right, so the People's protection. Temple people who w weren't in Guyana but who survived are calling your, the office and threatening the hospital. That must have been horrible. And so I come home, and I, so I'm home for this first weekend, and for the first time I'm not focused on myself and my pain, and I, I was focused on something else, and I thought, you know, maybe I should run for Leo's seat. Now, I come home on a Friday, the last day to take out papers to run for his seat was Monday. And there were already 11 candidates in the race, so, <laughs> you know, good luck, Jackie. Uh, so I go down with this whole contraption oh, on yeah. my arm, because I didn't, the radial nerve was blown out of my arm. They didn't know whether I was ever going to be able to use it again. Um, it miraculously grew back. Um, so I take out papers, I run, it was a six week campaign, I raised, this is so laughable, $20,000. Oh. <clears throat> now this is 1979 dollars, but still $20,000 wasn't a lot of money, and, um, and lost. Yeah, yeah. But it really set me up the following year to run for the Board of Supervisors in San Mateo County, right, right. against someone who had been there 20 years, uh, and, and to beat him. Right, exactly. And that was really the beginning of it all. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the big changes that we've seen is um, just uh, um, the role of women in government. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. And just, I mean, in many ways, you're, you're a pioneer. You're the 217th um, woman to be elected into your office or to, to, to serve in your office. Um, and I, I wonder if you can talk about just how it was for you, like finding mentors, figuring out how to do things, and, and how it is for, for people today. We still, it's a, a quarter of the legislators are women, and I wonder if you can talk if, about, you know, when will we get to half so that um, it's really re well, representative, <laughs> representatives. Based on our pace, we're looking at, you know, 2130 or something. 2130. Um, it's, not, it's, not a good, it's not a good look. Yeah. Um, so... What I learned early in my um, elective uh, pursuit was that it's actually women who don't support women. Ah, uh, yeah. Because I remember passing out literature on a street corner, and a woman came up to me and said, I'm not going to vote for you just because you're a woman. And uh, I thought, how many times do we say that to a man? Right, completely. And so I've, my, my story is this. We will have true equity in this country when there are as medi many mediocre women serving in Congress as there are <laughs> mediocre men. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You know, um, I think about the church. Um, so it, 1975 is when we first started ordaining women in the Episcopal Church. You're and so enlightened. I mean, you uh, well, I mean, it, it's hard to describe, but there was this culture of kind of like the striving, driving, you know, hard drinking, even um, male-dominated culture. And it was the church of my childhood. And it, it's, a, it's a very different world. But, I, we, you know, we have one of those pioneering. We have one of the women who was ordained in the first year that the English church ordained women. Her name's Ellen Clark King. And she has a kind of internal strength because of all the times people said, I'm not going to vote for you because you're a woman. Um, and so you're right. It is that, that we're still at that pioneering generation. And when we have the mediocre women, then we'll, we'll see. What <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, the Me Too <clears throat> movement, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just, I mean, because we see things from the newspaper and, and you probably see things a little bit more deeply from your situation and in terms of just where the country is and, 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 and you know, what, 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 where's that movement going? So it's a, it's a very good question, and I have kind of a sad response. In all of the presidential debates on the Democratic side, there hasn't been a question about um, the status of women in this country. Yeah, the yeah. fact that they're still making so much less than men, especially if you're uh, a woman of color. Um, we don't have uh, a comprehensive paid family leave in right, this country. Right. The minimum wage is still abysmally low, and most of those jobs are held by single mothers. Yeah. They're not high school kids making pin money. So we have a long way to go. Uh, in Congress, it was egregious. Mm. And so I carried the legislation with a, a very conservative Republican colleague from Alabama. Mm. Um, so who says you can't work together? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and so we carried the, the Me Too Congress Act. Um, I can't tell you the number of stories of women who came to me talking about the most grotesque behavior 
by some of my colleagues. And it wasn't until we had a hearing and I said to the membership that was um, at the dais, and there are two seated members of Congress presently who, are, who have sexually harassed women. Uh -huh. And everyone kind of, you know, kind of got right. shocked by it. And then they wanted me to divulge, and I said, no, it, I am gonna protect the privacy of yes, those women. exactly. Um, because, you know, in, in one of the cases, she was a single breadwinner for right. her family. And she's totally and had dependent on kids. this for her salary and her, her so, um there still is a um, patriarchy of sorts, yeah. I think, in employment generally. Uh, yeah. When you look at um, Epstein, right, right, when you exactly. look at Weinstein, when you look at these people who use their power um, to treat women like they're chattel, yeah. um, we still have a lot. A long way to go. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, 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 you've been at the forefront of legislation having to do with gun violence. Um, you know, your personal story is so compelling. And I, I, I think, too, probably you hear from the people who, you know, uh, uh, gravitate towards uh, your story, too. Um, you, you worked on assault weapons when you were in California. I, it's something that's just really hard for me to understand. And maybe it's because I, you know, spend a lot of time in the, in the West Coast, in California. Um, but, it, you know, when that assault weapons ban um, lapsed um, and it wasn't renewed um, at the federal government level. I just, I don't understand, are, are, are most Americans think that we should have uh, assault weapons in our households? Or, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about why we are where we are with gun control and, and why we're at such a, it seems like such an um, impasse. Uh, it, it, it's funny, if you think of you, you know, doing the sit-in in, in, the, in, the, um, in the government, I mean, it, it, it's interesting interesting that that's the issue that people are sitting in on. I mean, it, it's the one thing that just seems like we're so at loggerheads, we just don't seem to be able to make progress on it. It's, um, it's a very black mark on our country. First of all, um, the bill that passed the House that's sitting in the Senate does nothing more than close loopholes in an existing law we have in this country that says you need to do a background check to make sure the person who's buying the gun isn't a felon, hasn't committed domestic violence, and hasn't been deemed what the term of art is uh, mentally defective. It's a horrible word, but mm. it's actually a judicial All right. finding. Um, and so that's a very hard standard to even reach. But that law went into effect uh, in 1994 before the internet. So we just needed to um, update it so it was reflective of the fact that now we have the sale of guns at gun shows and on the internet. So that should be the easiest lift. Yeah. And yet it isn't. Now, I think we are at a tipping point. The NRA, uh, for good reason, has lost a lot of its luster. Um, it should not even be a nonprofit. The, oh, that's the, interesting too to think that it's just as well, much of a nonprofit as a priest right. cathedral is. And they were the recipient, this is another problem we have, of um, Russian money. Oh. That, um, so you can receive foreign money as a nonprofit in the United States and there's no limit on oh, it. Oh, wow. That is amazing too. Which is pretty interesting in and yeah. of itself. So you have, you have this NRA that has so indoctrinated a population for so long that, you know, if we do anything except loosen gun regulations, um, they're going to take your guns away. So that has been uh, around. Then you've now come to find out that um, Wayne LaPierre was using it as his mm -hmm. private piggy bank and going on you know, luxury travel and staying in hotels and having his wife's makeup done by makeup artists all on mm -hmm. the NRA's dime. Um, you start to look at it as, well, maybe this isn't a non-for-profit. It's really an arm of the gun manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So you have that going on. Um, over 70% of gun owners think that we should have a ban on assault weapons. Yeah, that was, I would guess that. And 85% or thereabouts think we should have the instant background check on all yeah, guns. Yeah. So gun owners are recognize that we've got a problem in this right. country. I mean, 40,000 people a year are dying from gun violence, two-thirds of them 
by suicide. Uh, right, right. Um, and these mass shootings um, are, interestingly, uh, disaffected young men, uh, some of whom have um, a, a level of misogyny running through their veins. Right, exactly. That's what Rebecca Solnit said when she was here last year, just that, that that's what they all have in common. It's not, uh, you know, there are not a lot of women who we're, uh, we're learning about in the news in that role. Yeah. Um, the, the Las Vegas shooter had been convicted of domestic battery. Uh, the um, shooter um, at the church in um, Texas had um, been arrested for domestic violence. Yeah. The Dayton shooter, I think, had a list of people he wanted, women he wanted to rape. So there, there was that thread yeah. running through it. There's a, a book called Rampage that was written by a professor um, who's now the um, acting president at uh, Boston College, I think. Um, and she l saw that it wasn't so much they were loners as much as they were rejected joiners. Mm. That's in school. And so we have an obligation really to start identifying these kids when they're young right. and getting the resources for them so they don't feel this sense of um, rejection yeah, that then yeah. that sends them on these murderous Right. I, I think the word rejector is a great you know, addition to how we understand mm -hmm. human condition. When one of our traditions we have is we take um, questions from the audience. So people write on little cards, they write questions. <coughs> and they, they, they're Excuse some me. brilliant ones almost every time. Um, but uh, so you'll have a card. Almost like every time. <laughs> almost every time. You know, but we're human, you know. It's just, I love that when, when we have just as incompetent women as we have incompetent men. <laughs> um, you know, uh, one of the things that young people talk to me about all the time, it's like, um, it's, uh, it's about the environment. Um, and they really do regard climate change as being like the most important issue of our time. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about just like your fellow members in, in um, Congress, just uh, do, do, do you associate with a lot of people who just don't believe in climate change? And maybe you can also just talk about like how are you, what kind of orientation do you receive once you go, get to Washington? Is there like a class you take about, you know, what for, about foreign policy, basic economic concepts or, you know, the science of climate change or anything like that? So climate change, uh, marriage equality, gun violence prevention, those three buckets are issues that Congress has been absolutely inept at trying to legislate around. And I'm convinced it's because we still have a lot of baby boomers in Congress, Yeah, people like me. Um, and I think once we kick us all out and allow the, the millennials to take over, those are issues they get right, already. Right. They were raised doing you know, active shooter drills as opposed to fire drills. Their you know, closest friend is gay and married. Right. Their um, uh, recognition that this, th there's no confusion about the fact that the planet is going to burn up if we don't take some Thank dramatic you. steps. The good news now is, is that most Americans, Republicans and Democrats now recognize it. But it's, yeah. it, you know, it's been hard convincing them because there are a couple of climate deniers out there, and so some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle kind of glom on to that as if that's um, reality. Now, I think this, um, the, the Alabama hurricane right, story. Right, exactly, uh, yeah. At first I thought, you know, let's move on. Yeah. But, but then when you started digging in and found out that there was actual pressure put on the National Weather Service to change what they yeah. knew to be true, it, it, it is really appalling. So, um, but well, I think the there's certain aspects of government that we just expect to be completely, a wertfrei is the German word, value neutral, you know yeah. I mean? Um, and, uh, and, and so that was, I, I just think it was a shock for all of us to think that everything can be political or regarding the political through a political lens. But I, I, um, I, I wonder just like science in general, I mean, um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you educate? That was part of yeah, your question. Yeah. It happens, like if you serve on the Science and Technology Committee, you have experts who come and testify on yeah, sp yeah. specific issues. When the Republicans were in power in the House, they, you know, you could hand pick 
people with the oh, that's interesting. Right. position so who, that you... Right, exactly. So you so would have three people of one position, and then the minority always got one, one voice. But, um, you know, typically during those years, there was a reluctance to, to recognize it. Even though you had President Obama you know, joining w on the uh, Paris um, Agreement. Right, so so the, even the training will be politicized is basically what you're exactly. saying. Exactly, exactly. That's so, so interesting. But yeah, we, we definitely, our hearts go out to you because it seems like a, you know, one of the things um, uh, that I, you know, when you grew up in the Central Valley near Sacramento, basically, you know, 10 miles away or whatever it is, you know, I was very conscious of what was going on in Sacramento. I, you know, I did an internship when I was a, oh, when I was a, you know, college and, at, at, you know, and, um, and it did seem like the legislators were working very well together, the Republicans and the Democrats. And, and you mentioned that in your book, that, uh, that at national level, that's just not the case. And I, I, I just don't understand why that isn't or why it couldn't be in the future. It, it, you know, I, I was really shocked when I got to Congress at how, um, how poorly run it is. Because, you know, all these bills that we introduce, they get introduced. And, and then they get sent to committee and they just sit there. Now, in the state legislature, you introduce a bill, it has a hearing before a committee. Now, you've got to convince the majority of the members to vote for it yeah. and then move it through the process. But every bill has a hearing. Right. And, and so it's not just in limbo permanently. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, um, you know, there was a, a very important bipartisan immigration reform bill that passed the Senate, came over to the House, never had a hearing, never yeah. had a vote. And to me, it's a dereliction of duty. Yeah, and such a, I mean, can you imagine doing all that work on that bill and then you, your, your brothers and sisters in the other house are just not doing anything about it? Right. Yeah. So it, um, it needs to be reformed. I think we need to get rid of the filibuster. Yeah. Um, I think that we need to, um, Thank you. If, if we really want to have an effective federal legislature, we should move to public financing of campaigns. Uh, I mean, if you saw the number of freshmen in particular that have to go, you know, two blocks away to the congressional campaign offices of the Republicans or the Democrats and sit in cubicles and dial for money, instead of sitting in those committees, listening to the right, presentations, the debates, and that's what yeah. happens, they, sh they show up, um, they're there for 20 minutes so that they're registered as being there and then they leave and go make phone calls. It's, it's a horrible system. Yeah, 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 it is, especially because um, everything can be published for free on the internet. I mean, it, 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 there's a way in which everybody's voice could be heard. We can right. know exactly what everybody stands for, what their platforms are. It's, it, I think there's a lot of ways in which we haven't caught up to the technology that's around us. And, and it's amazing to me. I, I, some, I remember when I was serving on the Financial Services Committee when I first got to Congress. And of course, that was when the meltdown happened. That was oh, quite yeah. a bad that must have been fire. amazing, yeah. <clears throat> and I had a, a bill on payday lending and the usurious um, interest that they could right, charge right. up to 400%. I mean, it's, it's basically guaranteeing that people are going to stay impoverished that way and people are uh, you know, reaping the benefits. And so I, I had this bill and I was astonished by some colleagues who represented low-income areas that were voting against it. Huh for a couple of thousand dollars in contributions oh, so from the payday lenders. Yeah. But that's how easily yeah. some of these people can be persuaded. Right, exactly. I, I wonder if you can talk about just media in general. I, I had like a, a television producer in my office last week and he said, um, we don't broadcast the news, we make television. And I, 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 that was interesting because I, I think you know, how we use all these things is changing so much and I wonder if you can comment on that. Well, a 24-hour news cycle has been the, the, um, the nadir for all of us right, in terms right. of how we engage. I mean, the TV goes on first thing in the morning, and it stays on all day, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and so we're just we're constantly being bombarded by all this information. Sometimes we're hearing it four or five times a day, right? Um, but we can't seem to break ourselves. I mean, it's really good to break yourself of the habit. Just turn it off for a it's couple a days. It's a Sabbath, basically. And, and to have a Sabbath right. from it. And uh, it, it's amazing how, um, how much better you feel. But I will say this, um, that the polling that's been done more recently shows that the only media that people trust now are the local media. Mm, that's interesting. To bring news that is, in fact, 
fair and balanced, you know, right. that is, um, that doesn't have a spin. But, you know, virtually all the cable stations, I don't care which one it is, they all spin now. Right. They all have a point of view that they're pumping out. Um, you know, when the Republican congressman came out for impeachment and then had that town hall, and that one woman who was interviewed over and over again, she says, I never heard about the Mueller report. I, I, I never heard about, you know, <laughs> When I, and then of course she was listening to Fox, and so right. she she wasn't, right. you know. So we only it's almost like we we're we're in, uh, addicted to yeah. what we believe in, and we want to hang with, you know. It's, that's why you have the tribalism that's taking place in the country. You have all these the population moves to places where they feel comfortable. Right, right, right. That's so interesting to think, just being addicted to tribalism. And yeah, to, that local news, cause, I, because we do know the people here, who are here, and um, so that does lead to a different level of trust. I hadn't even thought about that part. But then there's all social media elements, too, which I wonder if you... you okay. know. Well, uh, don't believe do anything I? that you read on social media until you go to... Um, Snopes or um, PolitiFact or, yeah. I mean, because there's, there's so much. I mean, the bot world is so much bigger than, than you or I know. And it's coming from not just Russia anymore. It's coming from all these adversaries who want to um, diminish us as a country. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about the elections too, but we're getting so okay. many of these little... So yeah, we'll get try to these to, questions. Uh, there. I know, we're going <laughs> to pick it up. We're going to pick up the pace and see if we can do, do a quicker one on each. Do you see a path to returning to civil political discourse and to healing the zero-sum mindset that has become so pervasive? Absolutely. Great. And you've got to believe it too. Yeah. Um, we are capable of that. And we've got to demand it. And we've got to demand it from our leaders too. Yeah. And from the media, as you say. Um, one, could you share how um, tragedy, trauma, has affected your relationship and conversations with God? Um, mm. To what or to whom do you attribute your tremendous inner strength and perseverance? So I, in the book, I talk about my three Fs, family, friends, and faith. Yeah. And you know, in the prologue, I, I, you, can, you can hear that my faith was what came to the forefront when yeah. I'm bleeding to death. Um, you know, there were times when I, I was asking God, why do these bad things keep happening to me? You know, 14 years after Guyana, my husband was killed in an automobile accident when I was pregnant with our second child. And I, I couldn't, I, I didn't think I could yeah. go on. Um, but You're writing about it. It made me cry reading it. I was just like so moved by it. It was, yeah, of course. I mean, what a terrible thing. And then other things, so many other things have happened to you. So... <clears throat> um, the faith is, I've just been blessed by having faith at an early age. Um, I was the smug little kid that took my missile to mass before I was old enough really to <laughs> read it. <laughs> but, um, so, I mean, that's, that's a luxury that I have had, but it's also saved me. Yeah, yeah it's a so, gift. And the tragedies have made me um, more fearless, though, because I'm, I'm just, I'm not a, I can take on some of these interests because right. I'm not afraid to die. Yeah, what could be worse than going to the hospital and seeing your, your husband in the bed dying? I mean, you're right. Once you've done that, then you can walk into a lobbyist's office or talk to a, someone who has a different view or you know, um, stand up to entrenched interests or what have you. Okay. Um, have you um, seen where, when we were, where We Were Young, a Netflix special on the Central Park Five? And what is your reaction to it? I haven't seen it. I'm sorry. Um, these are the five young men who were um, charged with raping the woman, and then, of course, they weren't responsible for it, and yet our president um, still thinks... The person has a, a PS, which is, thank you for saving City College. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. What might you suggest for 2020 to assure a new president, to, to assure a new president? Which swing states ought we head to? Yeah. So... Um, Get out the vote. Oh, that's good. Thanks. <laughs> um, it's not confetti. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I'm telling people that you should scratch your vacation to Hawaii or Italy this summer, next summer, and um, take a vacation to one of our swing states. So um, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, Indiana. Florida, maybe Florida. Um, 
<clears throat> be too hot. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I was reading a story a couple days ago that uh, Jane Fonda was walking precincts in Pennsylvania. I, oh. Just the idea of her walking, walking precincts in Pennsylvania cracked me up. Uh, and she was engaging with people. And, and that's kind of my message. It's important to engage with people. You are more persuasive than you think you are. People that you don't think necessarily are of the same opinion as you. You know, the tribalism is comfortable for us. We live on the, you know, the left coast, right? So we, um, we're pretty comfortable here. I was in uh, what is now Josh, Josh Harder's district, so uh, down in the Salinas area, walking precincts um, oh, yeah. during 2018. And I came on this, this one house, and here's this woman in a chenille robe. I didn't know they still had chenille <laughs> robes. <laughs> And so I'm talking to her and saying, you know, this, I know the Affordable Care Act's important. We've got to protect you. Say, oh, yeah, I'm a, and we really, uh, uh, she, I, I was not convincing her. So I says, well, thank you for at least thinking about it. And I'm walking down the street going to some more houses. Then all of a sudden I see this car moving slowly. And there's the lady in her chenille robe <laughs> in the car. I walk up to her. She says, you know, I, I just thought about what you said, and I think I will go volunteer at the local wow. Democratic headquarters. That's, so yeah. you, you can persuade people. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's important not to give up on the people. And that's right. what democracy is, I guess, is it's not giving up on each other. You know, the farmers in Wisconsin aren't really happy. Um, and they don't make the most cheese in the world, by the way. It's California. But, yeah, I thought so. Uh, <laughs> but don't tell them that if you end up going to Wisconsin. <laughs> Um, the Freedom of Inter Information Act pertains to the executive. Do you believe that Congress should make th themselves um, available to um, FOIA requests? Freedom should Congress be subject to... Uh, sure, we should be. This, I, you know, we are really good at exempting ourselves from all kinds of laws. Um, but no, we absolutely should be. You, I keep reminding people that you own the office. Yeah. You're the employer, I'm the employee. So... Any of my work product, you should be able to access if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you suggest um, that we get rid of the Electoral College? And do you believe in reparations from African Americans? The two big issues. Uh, <laughs> Electoral College, uh, you know, we've now in less than 20 years have had two elections where the popular vote was not reflected in the Electoral College. It is anachronistic, it is, was a deal cut, at a time in our country when we were quite young, and you know, big state, small state was a, a different, um, a different measurement really. Um, today, it takes 11 states and 22 U.S. senators to equal the population of California, where we only have two senators. Mm -hmm. So we have have lost the one person, one vote, um, and the electoral college should be um, scratched. But it takes a constitutional amendment, and um, I don't know if we're gonna find that kind of support in the states that are small. So we're gonna live with that for a while until it becomes, I think, probably challenged in the courts in a way that would find it to be unconstitutional. In terms of reparations, um, how many of you have read the New York Times piece that they did? No. Oh, it's really important. It's, you can get it online, it's, it's so, um, Powerful. Um, yes, I do think we are, um, that we must pay reparations. I don't know, I, I don't necessarily think it should be in um, a per person um, sum because I, it's hard to trace some of that, but putting resources into um, African American um, communities, pr predominantly African American co communities, you know, the, the um, the African American colleges that kind of sprung up um, dec well, almost probably hundreds of years ago, get, giving resources to those um, establishments, those schools, um, I, those are two of many ways that we can do yeah. it, I think. Virginia Seminary just announced, um, our, one of our Episcopal seminaries announced in Virginia that they're going to, they've set aside $1.5 million, recognizing that slave labor is part of what built that, that, that school. So interesting. That's what built the Capitol. Yeah, Slave yeah, exactly. Built the Capitol. Yeah. The dome was built. 
yeah. with slave labor. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, as you may know, schools, including um, schools in San Francisco also, are uh, mandated to practice active shooter drills, also called lockdown drills. As a principal in the SFUSD, my community and I are deeply opposed to them, but are mandated to practice them. What are your thoughts on mandated shooter drills? Do you believe they are effective? What a great question. It's very, I mean? Where is this principal? I want her to no, stand, or him too. stand up she so we can shy, say thank you for yeah, thank um, you. being um, <laughs> the, the person that we can. Um, that is such a hard question to answer because in many respects in those schools where they had been um, trained, um, you know, they were able to lock the doors, put something up against it, get underneath. Or, um, but it also is creating a great strain and stress in our Children, youth. Yeah. I did a um, town hall a few months ago and I had two of the Parkland um, survivors there. Right had a, um, a, a woman who had married one of the survivors at Columbine. And I had a, a young woman in the audience, and I will never forget what she said, um, from one of the schools, said that um, she can't wait for her alarm to go off in the morning to stop the nightmares that mm. she's dreaming at night. Oh, that's hard. In terms of yeah. you know, being shot at. So, um, you know, I... It's a hard one for me to answer. I mean, you're probably in a better position to answer it than me because you're hearing from the families and the children who are scarred from it. I mean, when the American Pediatric Association president said that when a child is separated from his or her parent, this is now I'm moving into the migrants at the border, that the architecture of the brain is permanently impacted. Mm -hmm. um, that should alarm all of us. So what happens to the architecture of the brain of a young student who constantly has to do these kind of drills? Um, when you're the person who's, who has experienced PTSD, I mean, you're the one who's experienced such extreme violence. I mean, it, um, it, you know what it's like to have those nightmares and you know, be glad when the alarm come, um, rings in the morning. The, um, the one thing that, that, is, um, that we know is that Oftentimes, children know who these kids are that will potentially um, bring a gun to school. Mm -hmm. And I think teaching them to feel comfortable telling someone and not being seen as a rat fink um, is really important yeah. as well. So if you have an answer for me, I'd... I'd <laughs> In, in the San Francisco schools. Um, given the influence of NRA money and the need for Congress people to run expensive campaigns and the desire to be reelected, re would term limits help lessen the money influence and help you help gun control be passed? So I was term, limit, term limited out of the state yeah, assembly and out of the state senate. Um, and so I, I know what that experience is like. Um, I, I don't know that it's been good for our state necessarily. Um, term limits in Congress, when you're dealing with these, you know, weighty issues of foreign policy and um, uh, funding the Department of Defense, it, it, to me, having a term limit is it, it would have to be a you know a significant one. You know, there is a fair amount of turnover in both. Congress and state legislatures, the average length of stay is only about six to 10 years. Um, now, the, the problem we have, and I, I noticed this when um, Senator Inouye was, um, when he passed, they had him lying in state in the rotunda. And I looked across at my colleagues on the other side um, in, in the Senate, and I, I looked and I thought, you know, it's like I'm, we're at a um, nursing home. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah, because you know there were a number of them that were frail, and um, and I thought, you know, having a age limit, right, right, is not a bad idea. 
Um, because I think at a certain point in time, you know, you have made a, a significant yeah, contribution. And, uh, There's yeah. a whole other generation of to have their chance. young exactly. people. And I'm telling you that the young members of Congress that came this year, oh my gosh, they are <laughs> truly talented yeah. and impressive. And in some cases run circles around um, the members that have been there a long time. So, um, so that's interesting. On the one hand, having experience in being a legislator, legislator is important, but on the other hand, um, it, making room for the next generation. And also too. having a fresh look and not yeah. being subject to, oh, we can't do this because it's never been done. Of course you can do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Would you discuss the relevance of the Second Amendment, um, the right to bear arms, um, noting that the Second Amendment related to America of 1787 and not to 2019? So that's true. Um, you know, there wasn't, uh, there, there was not a standing um, army at the time. So having militias in, in each of the states was seen as important. Um, that has, however, morphed in, through the Supreme Court in the Heller decision, which now guarantees that the Constitution um, allows everyone to own a gun. So, you know, that's our world. Having gun ownership in this country is legal. Um, we don't want to take your guns away, but I don't want you to have an assault weapon. I mean, I feel so strongly about that. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need an assault weapon. When we're going to give individuals more firepower than the law enforcement officers, when you have a, a Dayton uh, shooter who was able to discharge 41 bullets in 30 seconds, and had there not been law enforcement standing nearby could have created so much more yeah. physical damage and, and loss of life. So um, I, I think that we're past the point of recognizing that the Second Amendment was from a different time. It is part of the culture in this country. Um, but we need to put laws in place that make us safer. And we had an assault weapon ban for 10 years. It had a a sunset because the NRA demanded it had a sunset. Um, they, their power now is far less than it, it, it should be because their numbers have dwindled. Mm -hmm. And what members who still pay homage to them are doing is doing it because they don't want someone who's more conservative to run against them in a primary. Mm. Um, so the good news here is that they're not the biggest organization around guns in this country anymore. Women Demand, Moms Demanding Action has six million members and was created by a mother who after um, the horrible deaths in Newtown uh, said she had to do something. Yeah. So never doubt what Margaret Mead said, yeah, never right. doubt for a moment that a small group of people can change the world. It's the only way it ever happens. Yeah, that's, that's, that's inspiring. Um, when you first entered Congress, um, did the parties work together better than now, or was it always like this? Um, it feels like the parties <laughs> never work together now. So I came to Congress in 2008, and the... Um, the um, What's the, what's a good way of describing it? Uh, the the tension that had been created was already there um, because of the former Speaker of the House, um, who um, so Newt Gingrich that time period has right. had a that's that's when it's effect. I think started to shift because yeah. when I was there as a staffer oh right right Republicans exactly. and Democrats worked together um, well and they they tended to stay in Washington. On the weekends, so they, you know, they, they, there were friendships that developed. Yeah. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Members tend to um, go back to their districts on the weekends more, um, and so that um, a lot of that would have to change, I think. For but it starts. It always starts at the top. Yeah. If you start having the leadership of both houses of both parties uh, find reason to work together instead of th this constant state of um, enmity. Um, now we all have our values and we're going to stand by our values and we're going to protect our values, but trying to find middle ground. I mean, we do find middle ground more often than not 
because the country is still standing and we still have budgets we pass and right and exactly we, everything's so, still running <laughs> um, so there you know there is more of that going on than than we give credit to but um, I, I do think that there needs to be a, a dramatic shift and I'm yeah. not quite sure how it's going to happen but it it really, I, it could be with this younger generation too. Yeah, it could yeah, exactly. With this younger generation. You know, as we wrap up, I, I have to go preach a sermon, which I'm so excited about. I love <laughs> getting to preach. But as we wrap up, I wonder if you can just um, tell us what your advice to young people is nowadays. Because you, when they come in your office and they're like that young girl that you were when you were in college or in high school, you know, what are you, what are you saying to them? What are you sharing with them as kind of mentoring them in the same way you were mentoring So, yourself. I mean, I, I do talk about self-doubt and how we all have self-doubt, but uh, you just need to, you need to persevere, you need to, you know, just need to move through it. And you, you absolutely can attain your dream. You, do, do not let anyone tell you you can't. And if you've got naysayers in your life, you know, get them out of you. Sometimes they're family members. Uh, mm-hmm. But you, you don't listen to them. Um, yeah. you, you've got to... Tr- but if you believe in yourself, you can. You really can accomplish so very much. Yeah, yeah. Each person is so precious. You're exactly right. Um, on um, uh, September 29th, we're going to be um, hosting Chip Conley. He's oh, the hotel. Oh, I love Chip Conley. He, he is so good. Yeah, yeah. So he's our next person. Where um, he's the hotel entrepreneur and Airbnb mentor. He's going to be talking about age and mentoring in the workplace. I always thought he was too too young to be like an older mentor, but I guess it's just in good shape. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, uh, also, we, we have um, church at 11 o'clock. Please make a gift if you can to the forum. Um, and then I really thank you so much, Jackie, for both for your ministry thank and your you, work man. and for thank coming you. today.